You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hello, William. Welcome back for our next episode. Yes, and hello to all of our dedicated listeners. Yes, which we have gotten a good deal more of than either of us expected we would have at this point. <laughs> yeah, there's a ton of people listening to this podcast now. So thank you to all who are listening. This is, is a really amazing that uh, we have already gotten to see uh, a startings of a following, which is uh, it, it's ridiculously exciting. Yeah, there's been a lot more. Our downloads and our likes and interactions on social media have been on the rise, which is, is really cool. So keep doing that. <laughs> you guys are doing a great job. We're here to support you. <laughs> Keep it up. There'll be a a mid year evaluation around episode twelve. Yes, yes. We'll let you know. We'll let you know how uh, you're where doing. you can improve. You know, just <laughs> you know, casual criticism. It's it, we're all here to grow. <laughs> Before we get started today, uh, there are a couple of announcements that we want to make sure to make. Yes. The first is that. We are, the Common Descent Podcast is officially on iTunes. Mm hmm. So now you can listen to us on mobile, either through the Podbean app or through pretty much, I guess, any app that pulls from the iTunes store. Yeah. Which, from, from what I hear, is most of them. Yeah, that should be most of them. On my phone, I have Podcast Addict, which pulls from iTunes. Yeah. And then any iPhone, I guess, will. Oh, yeah, you just, the, that's their default. Yeah. So yeah, you can listen to us on on the move. Exciting. And the other announcement is, as promised, following episodes two and three, <laughs> we put up a Twitter poll and to so help far, it's us been going great <laughs> to help us settle the debate of snakes versus crocs. Now the Twitter poll, what I meant to do was uh, set it so that it would expire in time for this episode, and there's like half a day left on it, so I don't think the numbers are going to change much more. So let's go ahead and announce <laughs> the results. So there were three options in this Twitter poll. Either Crocs rule, Snakes rule, or we're both wrong, in which case people hopefully, you know, were able to submit their own suggestion. Well, we got 14 total votes, which yeah. is actually pretty cool because our Twitter following is not huge yet. Yeah, that's, that's for, for episode three, that, that was more, that was... Better turnout. I was expecting it just to be the people we knew. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so out of 14 votes, um, six of those votes said that we are both wrong. Yes. And we got a few suggestions as to other things. Uh, Lucas Hernandez, who I think is someone you know? Yeah, he's from the aquarium. Cool. He said that octopus rules. Which he, he's not wrong he's on. He's not they wrong. Pretty great. <laughs> that cephalopods would be a really cool episode to do. Oh, Absolutely. Uh, Michael Urban suggested that we should just agree that marine reptiles rule, which is a cool suggestion, but sounds like a compromise. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it's a pretty decent middle ground. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> and then our friend Ethan said Omomyads, because of course he did. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Omomyads are a very early ancient group of primates, um, which is... Incidentally, is an incorrect answer. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry, Ethan. <laughs> yes, That's... you are disqualified, but thanks for playing. <laughs> <laughs> a primates episode uh, is certainly bound to happen as well. I'm oh sure. yeah, definitely. I mean, it's even you just have to get there at some point. Yeah. Everyone so reaches rock bottom. <laughs> 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 He's gonna subscribe. Yeah, <laughs> so we'll, I'm sure we'll get a, a strongly worded tweet. At the end of this, Ethan, Ethan, you should come on the podcast and help us talk about primates. Yes, we'd be happy please to have do. You. Um, the remaining eight votes We're then positioned very wisely went to Crocs versus snakes, and of those eight votes, six of them were mm -hmm. for Crocs. Yes, they were. Now I think that this is a perfect demonstration <laughs> of the importance of sample size. <laughs> in scientific surveying. See, when you, when you have a small number of people or a small sample, 
sometimes you can end up getting downright erroneous <laughs> results. And I think that we've demonstrated this very well. <laughs> it just says that we have to do more testing for larger samples uh, to find all the other people who agree that Crocs are I'm glad you said that, actually, because if you look at the Podbean download numbers and like numbers, the Snakes episode has way more downloads and likes <laughs> than the Crocs episode. And that's a it's, huge, much bigger sample size. It's the newer one, though. That's that's completely like now we have to take into date. But episode you know, one the, has the most. Well, yes, because so, they have to start there. <laughs> I think we can all agree that we can call this one a draw. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I'm disappointed in our Twitter followers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, oh. What this tells me is that we need to do several more episodes about snakes. <laughs> Just keep putting it on Twitter. <laughs> until we will continue to do episodes about snakes until our <laughs> poll results <laughs> are correct. Are cor- are ac- until your opinions are correct. Yes. Anyway, what are we talking about today, Will? So we have we have a cool subject. So we're we're moving away from talk, like trying to cover a group of animals mm-hmm. and going to more a an overview of a, a, an evolutionary subject. Yeah, and a today's will be island ecosystem and evolution. Yeah. So basically, how do things differ on islands compared to the mainland that we're mostly used to, and that it compo- composes the majority of ecosystems. Yeah, things get weird on islands. Oh, weird really fast. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, we're just going to be trying to go do a huge umbrella overview of just kind of why islands are so weird, how they're weird, and some cool examples of that weirdness. Very cool. Which could easily spawn off into multiple, multiple other discussions. Yes. But we'll see how much we can cover this episode. Very cool. But before that, as usual... The news! Time for the news! And now for our unnamed news segment. So <laughs> submit your suggestions for what we should title our news segment. Uh, all the puns, please. I, uh, I'm i ready for them. <laughs> 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 Alright, well, would you like to start this one off? Sure, I actually have a couple of short ones today. And the first one I want to mention is actually super related to our uh, episode topic. Hey. So this is about an ancient tortoise... From the Bahamas. Hey, cool. So this is a story, a a big group of researchers from Germany, the United States, and the Bahamas work together on this analysis of a tortoise fossil from Great Abaco Island in the Bahamas. Finding a tortoise fossil in the Bahamas is not really a weird thing, obviously. But what's cool about this is that they were able to extract DNA from it. And right. that's unusual, because ancient DNA tends to preserve, you know, the best conditions for preserving DNA are cold and dry, mm-hmm. and a, a cons- you know, sort of a stable environment. So caves and permafrost are really good. Tropics tend not to be that way. Yeah, that's very unusual. So animals that live in the tropics, especially reptiles who are a major portion of tropical ecosystems, Mm -hmm. we don't really know anything about their genetics because it's really hard to get their DNA. This tortoise is about a thousand years old, and it was found at the bottom of a blue hole. So a blue hole is a sinkhole that has filled in with water. They're they're really awesome. Yeah, it's a cool phenomenon. And the, the fossil hunters scuba dive. So they dive down, and I think this this goes down uh, quite a long ways. I want to say it was about 100 feet deep. Yeah, they typically do. I, I got to, the visiting the Bahamas with my family, got to jump in a blue hole, and it's it's insane how dark it gets in the center because yeah. of how deep they are. In addition to darkness, it also, they tend to get anoxic, which mm-hmm. is to say, when you get down below a certain depth, the oxygen disappears from the water because of what's living down there and what's not getting down there because of the decomposition that's going on. Yeah, lack of current. Yep. And stagnant, oxygen-deprived waters are really good for fossil preservation. Yes. And it turned out that this case, they were really good for DNA as well. So this is one of the 
fir there's been a few other cases of tropical ancient DNA. Uh, this is the first one that I know of from a reptile. So this is the tortoise is about a thousand years old, and it belongs to a group of giant tortoises. You know, today we're famously there are giant tortoises in the Galapagos Islands. Mm -hmm. There used to be giant tortoises in the Caribbean as well, spread across the islands, until about 800 years ago, which was shortly after, no surprises, uh, humans showed up. Yeah. <laughs> which is a thing that tends to happen. <laughs> but they were able to determine the relationships of this tortoise. It was related. It's a relative of the tortoises of the Galapagos, as well as one of the mainland tortoises in South America. And hopefully what this will do is set a precedent for what to look for when trying to find tropical ancient DNA. It's the cool thing with these kinds of discoveries when you not stumble upon you. It's not that they tripped over, but they came across something surprisingly important, mm -hmm. you know, without knowing that's what they were finding can open up a whole new way of just going, oh, now we know to turn over those rocks when we come across them now. Yes. You know, we just didn't know that they were that important. Now we do, and you can, you know, and you get those moments of renaissance where now people start looking at it in that new way and discoveries just come over, hand over fist. Yeah, that's been happening a lot with dinosaur stuff, and we mentioned this in a recent episode with the news of uh, fossil proteins in dinosaur yes. bones. And it was really that for a long time, we didn't know what to look for or how to look for it. And exactly. now that we've been looking, it's it's a lot more common, it seems, for us to find things like that. That is actually an excellent sub segue into one of my new subjects. Oh, dinosaurs. So, dinosaur and a new way to look at them. So recently... There was it's a study on a dinosaur uh, found in China, Ankyornis, little small predatory dinosaur. Mm -hmm. They've known about this dinosaur for a while. They have lots of specimens. The news article said over 200 specimens have been found yeah. since the first one. So it's a well-known dinosaur, feathered, four wings, so it has feathers on the back legs as well mm -hmm. uh, that are long. They've even been able to get pigment from the feathers, so they know that uh, it was a gray black with white highlights and a red crest on the head. Yep. They know this dinosaur really really well, but just recently they took another look at it even deeper using uh lasers. Yes, which is you get to use lasers if you go into paleontology, so there's a plus <laughs> for anyone looking for a career. <laughs> it's called laser stim stimulated fluorescence. Right. And basically they shine high intensity lasers onto the fossil in a dark room and it makes certain aspects glow and they can then record the wavelengths of the different areas that are bouncing where the light's bouncing off mm -hmm. and for certain fossils they it's a new enough technique that they're not sure where you know what materials it works with and doesn't work with but in situations like this one where it was preserved well enough it actually allowed them to outline many of the soft tissues ah skin and Feathers and things like that. Absolutely. So uh, around the bones now, they had outlines of where the muscle and skin would have extended to. Interesting. Which gave them a couple of really cool observations. Uh, it was a very bird-like dinosaur, which they already knew to an extent, because originally it had been classified as a bird. Oh, okay. Until the more research was done, and they're like, no, birdish dinosaur. Right. Uh, <laughs> but it is a very bird-like dinosaur to begin with, but it had drumstick legs. Uh, like thick at the top and then... Yeah. It oh, had cool. the, your classic drumstick legs. <laughs> it had a slender tail that they compared to chicken, but also the scaly foot pads. Yeah. That you see on. So they had very similar feet, or this dinosaur did. But the coolest one to me is it had a patagium. Yes. And so a patagium is a piece of skin on the inside of the elbow for modern birds still have this. And it's basically just where that bend in the elbow is, there's a piece of skin that actually comes out from it, acting as an extra connection between those two parts of the arm, the forearm and the upper arm. Yeah. And it's very common in 
lots of animals. Bats have it. Birds, as I said, had it. Even the pterosaurs had it. Yeah. It's, 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 I think it's the propatagium. Yes. When it's in yes. front of the arm. Yes. And this gives support that this dinosaur could very, very well have at least been gliding, if not flying. Interesting. Not 100% because there are birds today that have patagiums but are now flightless. So Right. So maybe it had it for a different reason that it had mm-hmm. evolved and it hadn't quite made it evolved flight. Or it had flight and, and then, then lost it or, you know, somewhere in that vicinity. Yeah, the, the dozens and dozens of reasons it could have. But it's really cool because this shows that uh, the fossil was about 160 million years old. Mm -hmm. So late Jurassic is when these guys are around, and already at that point, we were getting very bird-like dinosaurs that were getting some of the the things that we see today as modern and derived were already showing up in the flesh back then. Cool. And that's interesting because that's actually earlier than Archaeopteryx. Yes. The famed first bird. And it really does drive home this idea that, you know, as much as we like to imagine evolutionary processes as a straight line, mm-hmm. it really is, just like we were talking about snakes last time, Yeah, surrounding the lineage that f- evolved the c- familiar creatures that you know, there were a whole bunch of branches doing very similar things with very similar body shapes. When you come across a good idea, everyone's going to want to use it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it's pretty cool. That's really neat. That's also really cool anytime, because there was another recent study that came out this week about a plesiosaur that had soft tissue yes, preservation yes. around it. And what this is really great for, uh, in addition to telling us about their features and, and what behavior and such they may have had, is that this is a real help for paleo artists. Right. Because one of the biggest question marks when it comes to extinct creatures is we it's hard to know how much meat and muscle and skin there was around the bones. Yeah, were you flabby? Were you skinny? Did yeah. you have big, thick skin like a rhino? Did you have, you know, ornamentation? Yeah. Or was your skin super tight on your head like a crocodilian? Or was it like a hippo where you couldn't even guess at the shape of the skull yeah, because you don't the, get to the see head the... is so beefy? giant teeth because yes. of the big lips. So this is this is really cool that uh, this happened with Cetacosaurus C- mm-hmm. not too long ago where they got, they examined a really this was a small ceratopsian dinosaur, not yeah. even close to birds, but it also had a patagium on the back legs stretching out to the tail. Right. Which looks like it may have been something that was pretty common in dinosaurs to have these cool skin flaps that we didn't mm-hmm. really know about beforehand. It's it's exciting. It's it's just from the fun aspect. It's cool to know that nowadays, you know, not all of them, but nowadays when you see a drawing of a dinosaur or a dinosaur shown in a documentary, you're closer than you've ever been to seeing what it might have actually been like. Yeah. And that's just makes the little kid in me so happy. <laughs> Yeah, we're we're able to know things about them now that people would not have thought we would be able to know mm-hmm. 10, 20, 30 years ago, which is is super cool. It's fantastic. Cool. All right. So I'm going to bring it back to back to very, very, very recent. This next news story is about oysters. So this is a really interesting perspective as far as applications of paleontology go. So this is a a group out of William and Mary College in Virginia who were studying the fossil record of oysters to compare them to modern oyster communities, specifically looking at Chesapeake Bay, basically to help us learn how to conserve oysters. So the idea here is that they were looking at, they looked at thousands of fossil oysters between 80,000 years old and 500,000 years old. And what this allows them to do is look at what oyster populations looked like before humans showed up and started eating them. Oysters, you might not think it, but oysters are a huge part of cultural, especially in the Northeast United States, mm-hmm. history. 
Like they were a staple of meals. You know, I, I live on Long Island and I've been out east where the oyster farms are. And they'll tell you that oysters used to be the big thing for a long, long time. Yeah. And they're still a big part of Northeast, you know, diet and delicacy and such. Mm -hmm. But there are conservation issues. And one of the things that's a struggle with conservation is that people have been hunting oysters for hundreds of years. And one of my favorite quote from the press release of this article was that the uh, the researcher said, a manager of the Chesapeake Bay has never seen a healthy oyster reef. Yeah. Because we've been disrupting these reefs for so long, the only way to investigate what a healthy oyster reef looks like is to go to the fossil record. So they examined a bunch of oysters. They uh, cut through them to look at the growth bands, which allows you to tell their age, their life history. And they found a couple of really interesting differences between modern reefs and ancient reefs. Uh, predominantly that oysters were living longer back then and mm. thus getting bigger. So living longer, we're talking six or seven, you know, five or six years in today's oysters versus 30 or 35 years in the fossil oysters. A significant difference. Yeah. And when they get big, that's when they get old. They all become females and they start having tons and tons of little baby oysters. And what they were finding is that a healthy reef basically needs those big oysters because they're supply, you know, they're reproducing and they're keeping the reef going. But if you're hunting oysters, then you obviously want the biggest oysters. Mm -hmm. And so today's reefs are really depleted in their populations of large old oysters, which means they're not reproducing very well, which means that the reefs aren't staying healthy. Yeah. So this is a really cool part of what's called conservation paleontology, where we're looking at the fossil record, archaeological record, historical record of living communities to help us learn what they're supposed to look like. Exactly. So that we can then try to fix them mm -hmm. in the present. So their suggestion was basically, because I think there are regulations in place to protect tiny baby oysters. Yeah, that's with most uh, fishing. Yeah. There's a size l limit. You you have to be bigger than this to right. catch it because we don't want to wipe out the young, you know, the next generation. Yeah. So they're suggesting that there should, in addition to that, perhaps be a priority on big adult oysters. That if maybe if they're above a certain size or above a certain age or whatever, leave those alone too mm -hmm. because they're a staple in that ecosystem, in that population. Yeah, narrow the range in both directions. Yep. This was a cool study and news article. The conservation paleontology is one of the, the few modern applications for paleontology that you see more and more. One of our colleagues in grad school was studying, was studying it with bison in the Grand yep. Canyon to figure out where, basically where do bison need to and can be reintroduced by where were they yeah. before they were wiped out? You know, Is this an area where they were found? All right, they need to be here. It, this area, they never were found here. We don't have to worry about that. Yes. And that's it's cool the variety of ways you can do it because now we have where you're getting a snapshot of, all right, well, we thought we were doing pretty well at keeping this ecosystem healthy, but it's not been healthy the entire time we've been studying it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we don't know what it looks like when it's healthy. Yeah. So our baseline is wrong. Exactly. And that's that's really, and you mentioned that earlier, is that paleontology is one of the few times where you can get a true baseline for ecosystems without human interference. Because even, even if we've now been protecting an area for 50 years, you know, only by looking before we ever came into effect, it can you see that it's like, no, what, what it was like is 10 times what we've been keeping it at. Yeah. There have been a number of studies that have come out recently. I've written about this a little bit. Basically, that we've been learning that human agriculture, human effects on the environment, uh, transportation of different species from place mm -hmm. to place, those kinds of environment and ecosystem disrupting behaviors have been going on for thousands of years. 
so that if you look at an ecosystem today, even if it was pristine when the Europeans showed up and started trying to conserve things ultimately, well, we were modifying it since, you know, 10,000 years ago when the first yeah. humans appeared on these islands or in this region and started planting crops that took over for the native crops and also they brought rats along and you never saw this ecosystem the way that it was originally. Yeah. Yeah, so our our influence is deep in both space and time. Yeah. No, it's it's a cool way to be able to uh, it's kind of like a clear look at things. Yeah. All right. So last last news article. Uh, I am taking it back old again, and <laughs> yeah, just all about my stuff as, was overburdened today. Yeah, just about as old as we can go. I'm going 400 million years ago. Whoa. Uh, to learn about a giant bobbit worm. <gasps> yes, I'm very familiar with this one. Absolutely. I, this was actually <laughs> one of David's articles he wrote. Uh, yes, the I news did. article. But this one was cool. So background information for everyone. Bobbit worms are fascinating, awesome, little terrifying monsters of the sea. Yes. They are part of a group called polychaete worms, which are, you can also, you'll also hear them called bristle worms. There's tons of variety. One thing a lot of them share is little jaws, like actual hard toothed, not made out of exactly the same stuff as art, but hard mouth parts. Mm -hmm. for feeding, many of which have a significant bite, some of which, you know, can regularly bite people, and some of them use them to hunt live prey. The bobbit worm is a fish-eating worm, mm -hmm. lives in the bottoms of oceans, has a burrow, and it comes out uh, like the moon worm from Star Wars. It comes just out, and it <laughs> bypassing fish, it will grab them with these jaws and pull it into their burrow. And the jaws are terrifying. They can put huge gashes and even have bisected fish before. Yelp. So they can get up to over a meter long. I think the longest one was three meters uh, that they ever found. So that's ten feet. Yeah. Oh, On average, yeah. you're looking at more around three feet long for these yeah. guys. But And they're only about an inch in across in diameter for their width. Yeah. But these long little trap jaw worms. Yes. A fossil one was found, and this is exciting for one, because worms don't typically fossilize because they're squishy, mm -hmm. but the mouth parts are hard enough that they persisted. Yeah. And so they were able to tell that it was a bobbit worm, and it was a big one. And it's called Westroprian armstrongi. I love the la the <laughs> the species name. Yep. And they discovered it a while ago uh, and just were able to actually notice what they had. More recently, the mouth parts are about 10 times larger than your average bristle worm, and when they put them together while the mouth was open, it would be over 2 centimeters long, uh, wide, basically. And they have the size of an estimate averaged for about 3 to 6 feet long. So mm -hmm. getting up to the upper sizes of what bob worms get today, so this is far larger than most worms are today. Yeah. Which is just cool that there was that big of a worm, but they were all saying this is the first evidence of gigantism in these kind of marine worms found in the fossil record. Yeah. So they've been big and scary for a while. Yes. So this, they had achieved one to two meter long death trap jaw worms before the vertebrates made it on land. Yeah. Like this was <laughs> Way back when alongside trilobites. Yes. And so it's... And, and the fact, once again, it's one of those cool things where... And the body, the you know, the general plan of action still works. Like it, still yeah. doing <laughs> what worked back then works today because there's still things in the water for them to eat. Yelp. Still working. This was fun one because I wrote that article and then uh, Earth Touch has a Facebook page and so all mm -hmm. the articles get posted on there. And the comments for that article were full of Tremors references. Yes. <laughs> People calling them graboids. Which, in hindsight, is a joke I should have made in the article. Mm -hmm. And I did I was tempted to <laughs> reference that. And then I had a moment where I was like, oh, the moonworm's a little more recognizable. But they are absolutely... <laughs> like, the mouthpieces even look like graboid mouthpieces. I wouldn't be yeah, surprised if there was some influence there. <laughs> 
funnily enough, uh, for people who haven't caught on to the the comparison, because when I told Ashley about this, she caught on to it right away. Bobbit worms are called bobbit worms, named sort of unofficially after what well, I think her name was Lorena Bobbit, the woman who was famous, if I remember correctly, for mutilating her husband. Oh, so these worms were their familiar name is named after a real life uh, horror movie character. Well, there you go, worms. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, and they were around as far back as four hundred million years. Yeah, <laughs> they've been at it for a long time. No, oh, it's it's. Well, I'm sure we'll post something uh, in the blog, but if you, if while you're listening to this, look up videos of Bobbit worms because it's yes. fantastic and horrifying. Like <laughs> when we um actually will link that article that I wrote, mm-hmm. and in that article there is a link to an earlier article I had written yes. about Bobbit worms, where you'll get to see a video of them sort of catching fish. Uh, and then you should just read terrifying. all of David's articles. And then you should read all my articles. <laughs> Bobbit worms are legitimately like that's a creature that it's, there's a there's a short list of real life animals that could have a horror movie made about them without having yes. to make anything up. Yes, bobbit worms are one of those. Even when they catch fish, because they'll snap up, catch it, pull it down onto the sand, and there are a bunch of really awesome videos where the fish the head is still sticking up out of the sand for a second, and then it gets. <laughs> Sucked yeah. back down, and it's, it's like the, you. That's already a horror movie scene. Yeah, it's the moment where he's calling <laughs> to his friends. <laughs> yeah, and he goes, "Help! Help! Help!" That's exactly. Yeah, they're they're terrifying animals. Good stuff. All right, cool. that is that is all the news articles, and that's the news, and that's the way it was. That's the way. It, that's the way. Uh huh. Uh huh. I like it. Uh huh. Uh huh. Cool. All right. So, topic of the day: islands, why they're weird, what they're, why they're cool, yeah. and how they got that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, quick intro: island ecosystems are weird because they have a couple of, a few unique qualities for being an island. Yes. That separate them from a mainland ecosystem. And islands can be varying sizes. You have tiny, very small ones. Australia is an island, so you can have very large ones. Mm -hmm. But effectively, an island gives you limited resources and space. You know, you can't, you know, if your food runs out on an island, you can't just go over the hill to the next meadow. You know, it's what is on that island isolated, which is a big part of it that it is cut off. You know, one of the big things you'll learn about if you ever look into basic North American and Eurasian fossils is when the land bridge connected and there was that big transfer of animals and people, same Mm -hmm. with North and South America. You don't get that on islands, except very rarely with like many land bridges, you know, peninsulas that turn into islands. But usually, once you're on an island, you're not going to get many visitors and you don't have anywhere to go. Yep, they're very cut off. And because of those things... You get some really interesting stuff. It very tend to be very fragile ecosystems, so they can shift suddenly, with extinctions being much more common. You know, it's yeah. you don't have anywhere to run from, and if you're, you know, only have so many resources, and a competitor comes along, someone's most likely going to get pushed out. Yeah, this is very evident from the fact that. When humans started spreading around the world within the last tens of thousands of years, the ecosystems that tended to suffer the most and the fastest were island ecosystems. Yeah, I, I saw one stat uh, that said that I'd put it around about half of the species that have gone extinct in the last recorded, I think, 400 years have been island species. Huh, that makes sense. So that it's really sensitive and... All of these things lead to some really cool ecosystems and interesting evolutionary trends and answers to life. Yes. So we should mention that islands, um, in addition to being big ones, small ones, you can also have different degrees of isolation. 
Mm -hmm. And you can get some of the most intriguing areas of evolutionary case studies, archipelagos, where you have yes. a bunch of islands together that can interact with each other in limited ways. Yeah, and there's plenty of famous ones, the Galapagos, the Japanese islands are also archipelagos. Uh, yeah, the Caribbean, like we mentioned uh, with the tortoises mm -hmm. earlier. And typically, islands get created in a couple, one of two big ways, either continental drift where a piece of land breaks off from a larger one as the continental plate shift, mm -hmm. or volcanoes create the islands as lava builds up. And so you can get islands form in different ways as well. Yeah. You can also get a lot of cases, uh, and there are a lot of good examples of this historically, where it's sea level rises and cuts yes. off a piece of the continent so that the, the, the land hasn't drifted away in this yeah, case. It hasn't moved. It's just that it has now been separated from the mainland by water. Yes. The, and the, the volcanoes are often how you get the archipelagos where the continental plate moves over a hot spot and basically just keeps popping up little baby islands. Yep. And you get the, you can, when you look on the maps, you can usually see that they're in a band or a string or, yep. you know, something. It's very cool, you know, geologically they can track a lot of that stuff by looking at yeah. islands and everything. The Hawaiian islands do that. And it's cool if you look, if you go to Google Earth and look up, look at the Hawaiian islands, you can follow the ancient trail of islands and it goes to the west for a while and then there's mm -hmm. a crook yes and the chain of islands turns and starts going back north because the direction of the pacific plate movement changed it's it's really which cool. is really cool yeah so islands are interesting for other reasons one is they can be often hit and miss when it comes to fossils because uh, islands don't always stay around forever yeah or they can be very young and not have had time to build up a good fossil history. So it's usually on the bigger, more stable islands that we get cool fossils. But even looking at modern day islands, you can see the weird trends that mirror in the fossils and that you can then extrapolate must have also been happening. So there are probably uber weird fossil island animals that may or may not have gotten a chance to fossilize. Yeah. So one thing I wanted to mention before we kind of move on to talking about more of the aspects is how animals get onto islands. Yes, very important. Because that is that is a thing that there's lots of different ways it can happen. <laughs> so the... all the animals on islands obviously are birds and bats. Yes. <laughs> they <laughs> that's it. all have that's the only <laughs> thing. Everything else was carried there by a bird or a bat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> In some cases, yeah. <laughs> it definitely happens. So you can get things like that. Uh there's that even happens in water ecosystems where fish eggs can stick to a bird's legs and they'll move from pond to pond. Mm -hmm. You can get that with insects and other things that hitch a ride onto animals. Yep. The way it happens with lots of the bigger islands is the animals were already there when it became an island. Right. Yeah. Water level rise and cut them off, or Australia broke off and moved away and kept all the animals it had with it. Yep. And so that's they've always been there, just now they're stuck there. And yep. they continue to become weird you can get the migrating animals like birds and ones that can move cross water like crocodiles and some other ocean going animals that can actually come on to land still turtles you can see yeah tortoises do that mm -hmm. they'll float uh, across the water and, and end up making it to an island which is adorable yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh but you get other ones that'll float the um rafting which yep some people, you know, it, it, for a while it was argued whether how valid a method of dispersal rafting was, but I know that they found true evidence of it since then. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically rafting is the idea that during a storm or just by happenstance, an animal is on a usually a piece of vegetation, a tree, a big branch, you know, that falls into the ocean and floats it and just... By pure chance, at times, they will land onto islands. Yep. And there's either enough animals on the branch, or this has happened with other animals, that they can propagate. Uh, I'm sure most rafts, just like most floating tortoises, probably don't make it to islands. Exactly. But when it does happen, you have now a potential new place to colonize. Yeah, just out of sheer probability, most don't make it, but eventually, you know, if you throw a dart onto a map, you'll hit an island... 
eventually you throw enough darts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It's that idea. So islands can get really weird mixtures of animals. So you can find an island in the middle of the ocean that has this animal on it that you don't find on any of the other islands around it because that's the one they landed on. Yeah. And so you get some really weird mixtures that way. This question of dispersal is actually something that Darwin himself did a bunch of studies on, mm -hmm. where he did a bunch of studies looking at basically how long will seeds or eggs survive in salt water. Yes. Uh, basically calculate, all right, if it came from the mainland and it floated to this island, how long would it have to survive in salt water? He also did an experiment where he was talking about birds carrying things. Mm-hmm. So he took, I guess he got a hold of some duck legs, presumably <laughs> off of a dead duck, and he submerged them in water mm -hmm. and waited for snails to cling to it, and then he swung the duck legs around in the air <laughs> to see how well they could hold on <laughs> to test <laughs> if they could hold on during flight. <laughs> this is science experimentation at its finest. I love it. <laughs> and at the end, he basically showed that yeah, there's a number of legitimate ways for even animals that don't really move much, or yeah. even plants which don't move at all, to end up making it across oceans and and serendipitously ending up on islands. There, I mean, there's, there's whole plants where that's the basis of their dispersal. Palm trees, the famous coconut, is made the way it is because it floats. Oh, cool. You know, and it can disperse, <laughs> and there's... You know, so that's why you find those plants on, you know, why it's the, the, uh, the hallmark of islands is a palm tree. Because, yeah, you know, they're, they're made to be able to colonize those bits of land. Interesting. In some cases, uh, especially speaking of palm trees, it should also be mentioned that these days a lot of plants and animals have made it to islands because humans have brought them there. Yes. So I think in the Hawaiian islands, for example, uh, I believe palm trees we brought them there. Yes. Like, they're not a natural thing in Hawaii, <laughs> even though they're iconic. Oh, yeah. They're something that humans put there. Yeah, and that's uh goes back to when we were talking about the things you, you're you used to are not necessarily the <laughs> yes. things that are supposed to be there. <laughs> but humans bringing things to islands is one of the biggest dangers to them, and especially when it comes to animals, even when we're... even when it's not the typical invasive thing of we brought this animal for a job and then oh no it got out of hand but right. cats and dogs oh yeah cats are di cats and dogs are both devastating for islands that's a big part of that is because most islands lack large mammalian predators yep. because they don't travel over the ocean well nope <laughs> like they unless they were already there you know when the island broke off if it's a new island that formed there's typically not a way for a tiger or a, you know, yeah. mongoose or dog to get to it. They won't survive the journey. Reptiles are great because they're like, ah, month without food, I'll be okay. Yes, or my egg floated over there or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but mammals are rare outside of bats. Mm -hmm. Mammals are very rare on, on isolated islands. And even then, it tends to be things like rodents. So you get some cool stuff with, with animals filling in those roles that the animals, the mammals typically would fill. Yeah. So one of the biggest things that islands drive and allow for in a greater abundance than, you know, just about any other ecosystem is uh, speciation and specifically a type of speciation called allopatric speciation. Yeah. Which is when you have a single species, you put them into two separate areas, something divides them. This could be mountaintops or a river on mainlands, but in islands, it's the ocean. Mm -hmm. And then now that they're not able to mate between each other, their gene pools just naturally diverge. Yeah, so you get populations changing from each other now that they've separated. And even if the two islands were almost identical in ecosystem, you're still going to get some drift between their gene pools just because now I'm not going to share the mutation I had with that island, because I can't. Yep. So uh, so you get that really cool stuff with that. It's the classic things like Darwin's finches. Yeah. That is the go-to for that one animal split up into multiple different roles, sizes, and food types. You can get that within an environment, but the islands really make that uh, 
staple of that type of ecosystem. Yeah, and in the case of the Galapagos, even before Darwin noticed the finches, uh, the, 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 the example that drew his attention to it was the tortoises. Which I love. That on each island, the tortoises were different, even if they weren't necessarily behaving differently dramatically, their shells were different shapes on each island. Mm -hmm. And the locals could identify them. And this is something that is, in the Galapagos, is true of the snakes mm -hmm. are different on each island. I believe a lot of the invertebrates are different on each island. Because as they disperse through there, they're establishing different roles, different habits, different body shapes uh, throughout the archipelago. It's most exciting for me because it's, you know, you could put the same animal on 12 islands and you'll end up with basically 12 different animals after enough time has passed. Yeah. And in fact, they are natural laboratories mm -hmm. for people who want to study evolution and speciation. There's a couple, um, I don't remember their names, but we I'll find it and we can put it in the blog post, who have spent decades studying the evolution of Darwin's finches to basically say, like, this is an environment where we know speciation is happening, mm -hmm. where we know that new species are, are in the process of forming and in the process of separating from each other. So they've been studying the dynamics of those finches, and they've learned a ton about evolutionary processes, because this is a place where we know it's happening in, in, in an isolated, rapid environment. That is one of, this is a side note, but that is one of the reasons I hope human civilization persists millennia into the future because <laughs> how cool would it be to be able to have a super high-tech future museum where it's like all right here is the human documented research uh and we can now show you the genome changing yes. of these animals we've been trying that would just be amazing so, yeah we've been yep. studying them for you know the ten thousand years that our civilization has been <laughs> you know <laughs> progressing and now we can actually mark it yeah long-term studies oh this the longer the better <laughs> So this cool speciation, it's, my favorite thing is you get some really unique forms yeah. and lifestyles. One of my favorites is always the ground foraging bats in New Zealand. <laughs> yes. Like, you get some really weird stuff, not only because of speciation, where now these bats have been able to become a little different, but also there's no rodents, really, on the island that would be going through foraging, so... The ground's just kind of left open. Yeah, so there's a lot of food, and there's there's this whole niche that is waiting for something to take advantage of it. And so you have these bats, and they're not the only bats known to do this, but they spend more time on the ground than any other bat species. And when you go to that island at night, you will hear leaf litter rustling, and in, when you look <laughs> through an infrared camera, you will see bats scurrying around the leaf litter looking for food which is complete opposite of what bats are supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they can't do that on a mainland ecosystem because there's already established competition there. And predators. That's another big thing. Yeah, that's that true. Opens it up as you don't have cats running around or, you know, other nighttime hunting ground-based predators. Yeah. So even you may not be the best at walking around, but you don't have to because you're not racing a mouse and you're not running from a cat. Yeah. So you get some really cool things. Uh, and that's another one of those reasons island ecosystems are so fragile, is bats not the best at the foraging, but it's allowed to there. As right. soon as you bring in a professional forager, yes. it's going to push those bats out of that ecosystem, that niche, immediately. Yeah, or a professional thing that hunts tiny yes. foraging creatures on the ground, like a cat. As we go through this, just to kind of head it off of the past, you'll probably hear us mention New Zealand a dozen more times. <laughs> yeah, New Zealand's going to come up a lot. Yeah, I'm sure later on we we could do a whole episode on New Zealand. Yeah. Uh, it is a really weird, cool island with lots of odd things on it. Yeah. But another talk for another day. <laughs> probably one of the coolest things that you see in modern ones, but also in the fossil record that shows up, is island gigantism and dwarfism. Yes. Which falls under a thing called Foster's Rule, mm -hmm. which is a evolutionary concept that animals, and even some plants, yeah. will 
change in size depending on how much resources and space they have, with the average result of it being little things get bigger and bigger things get small. Yes. When on islands. And that is not 100% of the time, but that's what you see a lot of the time, so you get some really weirdly sized animals. Yeah, you'll hear these called insular dwarfism and insular gigantism. Yes. Which is that your species will gradually shrink or grow uh, because of all these things we've been talking about, that this is a different ecosystem with different uh, things available. Mm -hmm. And so it, everything is changed. Your parameters are completely different. And it's cool. One of my favorite parts when I was doing the background for this is looking up the the uh, uh, proposed causes for both dwarfism and gigantism. Yep. As to what would push an animal to do that. And for the dwarfism, the first few is what you would expect. Less resources, less space. Yeah. And they even point out the fact that a lot of islands are found in the tropics, and smaller is better for warm weather, because you can regulate your temperature more easily when you're small in hot areas. This is true. Yeah. You know, so those are just kind of straightforward. Right. It's, it's obvious. You want to be smaller because there's not as much food. It's it's where the whole and it's this this is not a hundred percent, but the whole uh, old thought of goldfish and tiny bowl is tiny goldfish and big bowl is big. Which yeah. does not actually work that way. There's <laughs> some aspects of it, but from what I've heard is the fish will stop growing at certain size bowls, but it doesn't stop growing in mass, so it just ends up bloating. Like, it, it's bad for the fish. It doesn't naturally yeah. <laughs> match the size. That's not quite how it works. And in this case, of course, it's not that you, you know, you put a an animal on an island and it shrinks. You know, this is yes. an evolutionary process over generations. Yeah, it's not that like a baby elephant born on an island is only going to grow to a certain size because it's on an island. Right. But a the baby that... elephant on an island will grow to be the size of a full-size elephant and then die because it starves. Yes. And so <laughs> the ones that are a little bit smaller do better. And that is a great example because pygmy elephants and mammoths have been found. Yes. On... Uh, a, co a number of different islands, and they both average at about six feet tall at the shoulder. Yes, they're little like pony-sized elephants. Yeah, maybe not a pony. A little bit. I mean, this is an elephant that could walk into your house. Like, yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> you could bring this elephant in your house, and it could live there forever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they were also in the past. Um, so today there are pygmy hippos, mm -hmm. but these are mainland hippos that happen to have evolved small sizes for other reasons. Mm -hmm. But in the past, there were dwarf island hippos as well. Yeah. So there are a couple other things that uh, the dwarfism could be caused by, and I, I like one of these because it is a cause for both dwarfism and gigantism. Huh. It's one of the, for the dwarfism, large prey items, large herbivores. Mm -hmm. The size is part of their protection against predators. You know, elephants aren't just big because it allows them to knock down trees. Right. Being big takes you off the menu for just about everything. Right. When you're on an island where there are no big predators, you don't have to be big. Yeah. There's less pressure, selective pressure to do that. That is also one of the causes for things getting big, because it was saying that if, it, if you're a tiny mouse... You're tiny because you can run away from the big predators. You can scurry <laughs> under stuff and hide in holes. If there's no more big predators, well, you can be as big as you want. Yes. Now, now being a slow, <laughs> big, fat mouse doesn't make you an easier meal for anything. Yeah. So it's that lack of predators goes both ways depending on where you started. It's really cool, and that the the lack of those big mammalian predators drives a lot of at least, especially from modern islands and recent islands, because mm -hmm. most apex predators and environments on the mainland are big mammals. Yes. And so when those can't make it out there, that completely uproots what we're used to. Yeah. The predators also was a cool one because it pointed out that if you're a predator that gets on an island, you see dwarfism with a lot of those as well. Evidently, snakes, it's very common. Yes, it is. And they were pointing out that if there's... No more, if most of the animals on an island are smaller, then you also should be smaller for smaller prey items. Yeah, as a predator, there's not, there's a lack of food now. 
Yeah. To feed a big animal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you want to hit some examples of dwarfs yes. and giants? Absolutely. So the the pygmy elephant is my favorite, but I think the next one would be Europasaurus. Yes. Which is a cousin, a, a relative of Giraffa Titan, previously known as Brachiosaurus. <laughs> it's still Brachio. There's there's two now. Yes, there is now. That's there correct. Is Bra- I think Brachiosaurus is one of them's in Africa and one of them's in North America. One of them kept Brachiosaurus and one of them's Giraffa Titan. That's what it was. They got split. Brachiosaurus, like the one, the first big dinosaur you see in Jurassic Park. Yeah. Really tall, long, long neck. Huge, huge, huge. They're they're going to be around 70 feet long, almost 40 feet tall. Mm-hmm. Big animals. Europasaurus was a island species cousin. It's its own species now, but it was a cousin of them that was about, I think the average length for most of the specimens they were finding was about uh, six meters long. So about 20 feet long. Yep. And that was for the length. So that was about a third the length. <laughs> yeah. For a sauropod, 20 feet long is tiny. Mm-hmm. This was a group of animals that very typically hit 40, 50, 60 feet. Yes. And the biggest ones were 90, 100 or mm-hmm. more. And so it, it's really cool to be able to picture just this very, you know, it still would have been the biggest thing on the island. Yeah. So it's still holding its same status <laughs> on that island, but it doesn't have to be, you know, 70 feet long. You only need 20 feet on an island <laughs> yeah. to be the big predator, on, the big pre- uh, herbivore on an island. There was an example of that. Europasaurus is Jurassic, and there was an example mm-hmm. of that at the very end of the Cretaceous uh, on a Romanian island called Hatsag Island, which we mentioned a, a few episodes ago in the mm-hmm. news, which was home to dwarf sauropods. Yes. Other ones like Megurosaurus, which were 20 feet long. But also there was a two-meter-long armored dinosaur that lived there. There was there were a couple of really small duck dinosaurs that lived there. So there were a bunch of these dinosaurs that typically got really big on this island were small. And as we discussed when we first mentioned this, I think in episode one, the apex predator on that island appears to have been a giant pterosaur. Mm-hmm. named Hatsagopteryx, because there were no large theropod, there were no big meaty yeah. dinosaurs that made it there, so the apex predator niche was taken over by uh, this giant pterosaur, which would have swooped down from the air on 35-foot wide wings and attacked <laughs> tiny dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which why they aren't making documentaries just about that. Once again, an animal that you don't need to embellish mm-hmm. to make your horror movie about. There was a fun documentary, uh, it was, uh, I think it was in Dinosaur World, which had a, a series of episodes, but one of them was about a velociraptor, you know, and it, it starts with him, you know, he, it's our protagonist velociraptor, and mm-hmm. it gets chased away from one of its kills by the larger theropods on the mainland, and it has to run out of step from the big sauropods that typically would be found around it. Uh, it may have been a Utah raptor. It's been a while since I've watched it, but yeah, some some dromaeosaurid. Talking about the fact that it's a good predator, but it is small for its size, and then it gets caught in a storm, rafts to an island huh. with dwarf dinosaurs, and now it's the king, and it uh, goes around and it's killing the mini, mini sauropods, <laughs> and it's chasing away the previously too big th- theropods. Uh, and it oh, was it was fun. very much a fun underdog story, but it was a cool way to introduce that insular dwarfism and how it you know that there really were yeah there actually were very tiny sauropods yeah little tiny island dinosaurs so one we have to mention before you know we start talking about all the big animals is homo florensis florisiensis florisiensis thank you named for the island of floris yes yeah this is in the indonesia area of the world and this is it was a few years back that it made the news everywhere. Mm-hmm. But if you guys remember hearing about the fact that science found proof that hobbits existed, <laughs> yeah, this is real what that hobbit. was talking about. <laughs> yeah. This was a relative of us that averaged about three and a half feet tall. Yes. That lived on islands, and it was affecting them. You know, affect, it, it would have affected us the same. Nowadays, we have tools and boats. Right. 
but it was affecting hominids just like any other animal. Yeah. Homo floresiensis is a cool one because, first of all, for a long time, and I probably still to this day, there have been people arguing whether or not they are a legitimate dwarf species or mm -hmm. just that the ones we've found have a disorder, mm -hmm. that they were small. Um, the people that I've spoken to who have studied it favor the dwarfism, like that they were a dwarf species. Yeah. But this is, to put this into context, Homo floresiensis was a couple 10,000 years ago, which means it was around at the same time as near modern humans mm -hmm. and Neanderthals and whatever the Denisovans are up in, I think, Siberia. Yeah. So there were a bunch of different human species. This was the one that was tiny living in the Indonesian islands. Which is really, really interesting. Yeah. So it's it even happened to us uh, lofty primates. Mm hmm. It's cool. The, and the list of tiny and big animals goes on and on. There's no way we could hit even all the big famous ones. Oh, yeah. For uh, a quick example of a modern example, uh, you can look at the Madagascar dwarf chameleon. Yes. Which I believe is the ones. smallest chameleon in the world at about an inch long. It's tiny <laughs> little. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy to even think you could function as a chameleon at that size. Yeah. Uh, you can even get some closer to home. The key deer here in Florida oh, okay. are much noticeably smaller than white-tailed deer. Cool. Uh, and it's they are they're found on the key islands, the you know, Key West, and all of those. Cool. So yeah, it's still happening today. If you go to islands, you can find examples. There's actually a lot of giant ones that are still around today. Yes. Let's talk about giants. Once again, we talked about the fact that the lack of carnivores, it would allow tiny screening animals to get big and other animals to fill that role. Mm -hmm. You see this with a lot of different animals, which is really cool. The Komodo dragon from the Komodo Island yeah. is the largest predator on the island. Now, interesting note about Komodo dragons, just to, to bring this up. I was yeah. researching them recently, and there was a recent study that came out that was showing that Komodo dragons, based on their living relatives and extinct relatives, it looks like they might not be an island giant. Mm -hmm. It looks like their entire lineage is huge. Yes. That they are not necessarily an island giant, but just a giant creature that made it to an island. Yeah. Which is a cool demonstration of how sometimes it's hard to tell. <laughs> it's yes. hard to tell oh, what exact pressures are working on, a, on an animal. I mean, one of the, one of their, uh, and I don't know how closely Megalania is related to the modern Komodo, mm -hmm. but Megalania was a monitor lizard that found in Australia. Which was huge. Not, about 20 feet long. Yep. And it's not too far from where you would find modern, I don't know the exact mileage and distance, but... Well, the, the earliest Komodo dragon fossils, I believe, are from Australia. Yeah. I think they started on Australia and then ended up moving over to the islands. Which makes me wonder if it's just like a, and I don't know how often this is, if this is a thing that has been seen, if gigantism in a lineage is a thing, to where right. big lizards as a group because they were on islands, but I don't know. Could be. Maybe they became big on Australia. And then now all of their descendants are also still big. Yeah. So it, it can get it can get a little, the, the fossil record down in that regard is not very clear. Yes. So it can be hard to tell. And once again, reptile fossil history can often be very hard to discern who who is more related to who. Yes. Because reptiles tend to be very conservative in their features. Yeah. And we don't get that tropical DNA to yeah. help tell us. Oh, if only. If only. But there are plenty of like good, solid, uh, gigant, giant examples. Mm -hmm. One of the ones that we mentioned earlier, the giant tortoises... Yep. I actually found a cool thing because it was talking about why are they big because it doesn't it's not necessarily seeming to be for you know they're not a predator and they're now filling that big herbivore role uh but then it could be either able to get around you know they can now travel better that mm -hmm. they're bigger across the islands and that being bigger makes you more stable if the island's ecosystem fluctuates to where oh yeah you're not going to 
puff out like the smaller species. You can you can wait out a you know year long drought because you're big right. and tough and you just as sit a there. reptile. Yeah, but the tortoises, the Galapagos tortoises, and uh, you know as we mentioned, there were other ones from other islands. Uh, they're one of the most famous island giants that are still around today. Yeah, they're, they're huge. Yeah, the tortoises are a cool example of how it's not just the size that can change, but your entire lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So a tortoise transported to an island where there aren't any deer or there Mm -hmm. aren't any big plant eaters will take on a plant eating role. My favorite example of this um, is with a lot of birds. Yeah. So very famously, birds on islands tend to do two things. They get big and they stop flying. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> There's a ton of examples of flightless large birds, but one that I wrote about recently that's a really cool one that we've seen at least a handful of times mm. is ducks and geese that end up on islands and become big, become flightless, and move away from the water to live mostly terrestrial herbivorous lifestyles. Yeah. I mean, you're getting animals that typically are are foraging for their food that are now filling the roles of cows. Yes. Of their becoming grazers and the big, heavy, you know, trudging herbivore. Yeah. And this, the the reason that the, the goose and duck example is cool is because this is something that has happened convergently in the same lineage. Mm-hmm. There was a giant goose uh, in Italy uh, during, I believe, the Miocene, Garganornis. But they also were the New Zealand goose and Hawaiian large flightless terrestrial ducks. Mm -hmm. Uh, Both of those examples, I believe, were around until very recently, which is to say until humans got there. Yes. (laughs) Because when you can't fly away (laughs) and you got big old drumsticks, uh, that's... It's bad news. I'm sorry, you got to go onto my dinner plate. Yeah. Especially if you can't build a nest in a tree that you fly to. Mm -hmm. If your nest is down on the ground where... Not only humans, but the predators that humans brought with them. Yeah, the rats off the ship. Get your eggs. But yeah, so you get these large flightless, you know, filling the niche of of deers and cows and deers, deer and cows and stuff, uh, which is pretty cool. It's really, it's really, and you get big birds on islands, as you said, is a theme. And, you know, the dodo is probably the most classic. Yes, a pudgy flightless pigeon. It's a big pigeon. It's a big pigeon. <laughs> and when we say big, because dodos are something that everyone knows about, but it gets really skewed because, I mean, they were in the movie Ice Age. Uh, yeah. And you, it's always portrayed as it's just a thing that went away because it was so dumb. Yes. Which is not at all. It, it went away once again because of us, just so everyone knows. Yeah. Classic example of, of human-caused extinction. Yeah. When we say big, these guys were about three feet tall. I mean, so... <laughs> Yeah. This was a big bird. Yes. And they were heavy. Just just huge pot bellies. Uh, but you also get some really cool, once again, going back to New Zealand, there's yes. two big birds there that are super interesting because they're filling both sides mm-hmm. of the ecological role of predator and prey. Uh, you get the moas, and there's, I think the biggest of the moas was right around 500 pounds. Yes. Big flightless bird, very similar in design to ostriches and emus of the long legs, long neck. So moas definitely deserve a a moment to themselves. These were the largest birds of all time ever. Yes. These were 10, 12 feet tall, uh, lived on, and of course, New Zealand, island. Yes. They were comparable to, um, a bit earlier than them, the elephant birds of Madagascar, Mm -hmm. which were similar Mm -hmm. size. Uh, these were sort of the pinnacle example of island gigantism. Yeah. And so these were big herbivorous birds walking around the landscape and grazing. Mm-hmm. And until humans at, showed up. <clears throat> until <laughs> once then, again. You know, we showed up and they were gone. And it's giant fried chicken. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> but one of their predators when they were, you know, for I assume the, the young of the Moas, was uh, Haste's eagle. Yes. Which is a gigantism eagle, uh, which they said had surprisingly short wing, but still had about an eight foot wingspan. Yes. <laughs> and was this big predatory bird feeding on the big herbivorous birds. Yeah, so they got big because the prey got big. And so now you have, 
we don't you know you don't have big mammals on either side of the equation it is birds eating the plants and being eaten yes and and host eagle was far bigger than any bird of prey today absolutely this was this was a, a sizable animal and it's cool cuz we we made that comment about crocodilomorphs that you could almost have an ecosystem of crocodilomorphs you know, <laughs> filling all the roles and that you know things like that had happened where there were crocodilomorphs hunting crocodilomorphs but you can see that birds are very similar in that role where you have ground foraging birds you have yeah. insect like the kiwi is a bird that's digging for and rooting around with a long nose for insects that yeah. once again is a island weird animal flightless bird and they're they're extra weird cuz they have their nostrils scooted down to the tip of the snout <laughs> yeah they're for a while there little birds they're so weird <laughs> And there are islands where the bird variety is just massive because they don't have to worry about the predators, so they have just diversified into crazy every option they could. Yeah. I do have a, a number here that I wrote down for Haas Eagle is estimated at about 30 pounds. <laughs> wow. And that same thing happened where Gargonornis, the giant goose, which itself was about 50 pounds, 23 kilograms. Mm-hmm. In Gargano, in Italy, you know, five, six million years ago, that island was also home to giant hawks and eagles, which were, or, or giant hawks and owls, mm -hmm. which were about as big as we see them get today. Yeah. Sort of in that upper range. And it, it's that weird question of, did the prey get bigger because these big predators were around, or did the predators get bigger because the prey was big, and the real answer is, once that starts, you're going to get this arms race. Yeah, they just both start ramping up together. And that can result in a New Zealand situation where you have both the largest bird of all time on the <laughs> ground and the largest bird of, preys of, birds of prey of all time <laughs> flying around trying to eat them. It's like a logical conclusion of <laughs> they just both be, end up being ridiculous. <laughs> and then for cool examples of both happening... On an island in Flores, where our tiny human mm -hmm. cousins were hanging out, there was, and still is, the Flores giant rat. Yes, yes. Which is, I believe, like twice the size of a, a regular house rat. Mm -hmm. And there were also uh, flightless storks uh, in the fossil record on that island as well. So you had all these sort of things coming together. It's, uh, like we said, the list can go on and on. One of my favorites I stumbled across was uh, a rabbit. Out of the Mediterranean islands. Oh, yes, I know what you're going with this one. The the Neurolagos, who yep. is <laughs> about a foot and a half tall. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a big that's a ridiculously big rabbit. And not quite thirty pounds <laughs> in weight. So this is a dog sized rabbit. I mean this is a medium dog sized Yeah. Relative of rabbits that had really thick, heavy bones. Yeah. And was most likely once just Tromping around, grazing and eating. My favorite example, uh, before we, we wrap up our sort of dwarfism gigantism, comes from, of course, snakes. Yes. In southern Australia, there is a species of tiger snake that is found on the mainland and then also on a handful of different islands. Mm -hmm. And depending on what island it is, these snakes have evolved island dwarfs and island giants, same <laughs> species, but the different populations, and the islands with the dwarf snakes tend to be islands that are sometimes smaller and then also limited food. You know, all there is to eat are tiny lizards and things. Mm -hmm. But on the large, the other islands where they have the, dwarf, the giant snakes, there is at least one species that a study found that during the nesting season... There is a species of bird whose chicks are huge. Oh. So on this island, the snakes gorge themselves on these birds for that nesting period and then wait for that time to come around next year. And this allows them to be larger than their mainland relatives. That's fantastic. So they've done both. And the same thing <laughs> happens with speckled rattlesnakes in near Baja, California. Mm -hmm. where you have a bunch of different islands, and there's dwarf species and giant species, depending on what the conditions on the islands are that they've moved to. 
That's really fantastic. Which, I guess I shouldn't say species, because I think they're all the same species, but they're different populations of the species. Yeah. So, yeah, it's super fluid, mm-hmm. uh, a changeable condition. Yeah, it's all it takes is one variable being changed that will then affect what all the others do. Yeah. And before we move on to the other one, to be, uh, as a, since now I, I remembered, and to be uh, petty, to bring it back to crocodilians. We can move uh, on now. That's, it's, it's okay. We don't have to talk about that. That's all the time we have for today's episode. <laughs> so, one of my th- favorite things I ever heard, and I don't know how much more research has been done, but I know it, that it was a preliminary thought, uh, is within the Philippines and throughout that area, there is a number of crocodilian species in those islands. Right. You get the false scarial, uh, Siamese crocodile, and the saltwater crocodile, the, which you also hear the Indo-Pacific crocodile right. because of where it's showing up. All overlap in there, and you get an interesting thing happening because of that, because the saltwater crocodile actively can move between all those islands. Yeah, because they are saltwater. They're, they, they're known to go out miles into the ocean to feed. So yes. they're <laughs> very actively. While the other two, uh, especially the false gharial, tends to be more freshwater environment, you know, maybe brackish, but it tends to stay in the, the marsh swamps. And it's really the unique thing with the false gharial because they are on the islands, but they're starting to get separated. Not okay. necessarily due to the island separation, because they could swim across. They'd be able to survive that transit. But the saltwater crocodile, being much more saltwater tolerant and preferring that brackish or actual salt environment, is going to be around the coastal regions. Right. Saltwater crocodiles are notorious for being the least social of all the crocodilians today. <laughs> yeah, not friendly. Yeah, most crocodilians, you can put them, they, they, you know, like you see the alligators just all sunbathing in big piles. And right. that's normal. They're what we call gregarious, where they group together, they're not really a family group. You know, if you take one away, they're not going to defend that one. Yeah. You know, but... They tolerate each other. Yes. Saltwaters do not. They are incredibly territorial. They will attack anything that comes in, especially other crocodilians. Their mate is basically the only thing they allow to live <laughs> and for yeah. the big males, their female is the one they'll allow to live, and even then it's patchy when people have had to try to introduce them for breeding purposes and human care. So you have to be careful, because if he doesn't like her, she might not make it out. Yeah, you're down one croc. So you have these rings of highly aggressive crocodiles around the coasts of the islands that the false gharials are on, and there's at least been enough evidence, or people have noticed that it may be causing speciation for that being the isolation factor because so for the gharials could cross between islands. Absolutely. But they're not because these <laughs> other crocodilians are hanging out. Because there. you have to get through two different rings of highly aggressive big crocodiles to get to the other breeding populations. Man. It's a really cool uh thing to mention actually that we are talking about these effects happening on islands because mm-hmm. islands are sort of classic examples of separate, isolated yes. little pockets. But this can actually happen anytime you have isolation in ecosystems. Yeah. For the famous example, sort of the famous other example, is this can happen on mountaintops. Yes. And there are some examples of this happening, especially in places like Western North America, mm-hmm. where you have mountains surrounded by savanna or desert mm-hmm. or sort of these dry ecosystems where if you end up on mountaintops you might find that species are diverging from each other across the mountaintops because they can't cross they can't leave the mountaintop basically. yeah they can't go down and up the yep. other side and uh because you know at one point the the ecosystem allowed them to all be down at the lower elevations where they can mix and then something right. pushed them up right for example if it gets warmer Mm-hmm. then these cool adapted animals are pushed up to the top of the mountains and now it's super warm down there or it's an arid environment or there's not the trees that you were eating or whatever, mm-hmm. you can no longer make your way across to the next mountain. So you have, they're, they're called sky islands yes. <laughs> when it happens on mountaintops. Which is awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah rivers, canyons. Yep. 
caves yes are really great examples of how this type of speciation can happen even on mainlands yeah so uh we we already kind of mentioned you know archipelagos and how you get those smattering of islands you also get larger islands like australia which still have weird animals on them but are a more complete eco you know it's a more continent sized landmass so you have that more filled out roles where the large predators and the larger or until the mass extinction of <laughs> all the megafauna but they had large herbivorous marsupials and predators yeah. and so on and so forth but you still can get that and islands do a really cool thing where they can act as something we call refugiums and this is a thing that results from that isolation where you can have a group of animals or single animal that gone extinct everywhere else except for one area where it has persisted either longer or even to today. There's many animals that fall within that category of being their remaining animals of the group or the single remaining animal of the group. Australia is a really great example of this refugium effect being that it is one of the remaining places where you can find marsupials and really the only one where you find them in great numbers. Yeah, where marsupials have since been sort of outdone and pushed out of other ecosystems where other mammals have taken over. Yeah, by the, the placentals, which is what we fall into. Yeah. You, you still see some down in South America. We still have the opossum yep. in North America. Uh, so you can see where they used to be spread. And then bef you know after Australia broke away, they started going extinct everywhere else. But Australia, they were able to remain the dominant mammals. Yeah, they were safe from the turnover that was happening in other land masses. And before we came and introduced animals, it was all marsupials. It was yep. no placentals were found there. Yeah, except bats. Yeah, bats. So of course because <laughs> it, bats. you can't yeah. keep them out of anywhere. <laughs> but before, you know, people the I, the dingo is such an iconic Australian animal, but that was brought over by the initial, you know, uh, uh, settlers. Yeah, that of we Australia. did that. Mm -hmm. And so you get really cool things like that. There's also some individual animal examples. Lemurs on Madagascar are a great example of a very primitive line of an you know ancient line of primates that you don't find anywhere else but Madagascar. Yeah. In fact, there used to be giant lemurs. Yeah. There were gorilla-sized lemurs <laughs> as another a gigantism example. Which is so cool. One of the, the coolest examples of the refugia, this, this idea of refugia where animals are hanging out uh, at the very end of the Ice Age mm -hmm. with mammoths, where mammoths went extinct pretty much everywhere on the mainlands, there were a couple of island populations that persisted for much, much longer. Yeah. And there was actually a study that just came out like two days ago, looking at mammoths on Wrangell Island, where these, these, so most mammoths disappeared by about 10,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. On Wrangell Island, they persisted until about 4,000, because they were safe from the ecological shifts and the human activities mm -hmm. that were causing their collapse on the mainland. So they got to hang on. But this new study did a genetic study a, a genetic analysis on one specimen of a Wrangell Island mammoth and found that the Wrangell Island mammoth had accumulated a bunch of mutations that oh. may have been causing issues for that population. Oh. Because when you're in a small population, bad mutations aren't getting sort of drowned out in a large gene pool. Yeah, inbreeding is going to become much more common. Yeah, this is the founder effect, which is a completely different conversation. Yes. <laughs> but basically, if a couple of the original island mammoths had these bad mutations, and there's only like 30 or 40 mammoths on your island, those mutations aren't going anywhere. Mm-hmm. And so it looks like it's possible these mammoth on the mammoths on these islands may have finally gone extinct because of their, their gene pool was building up these deleterious genetic conditions. Interesting. Yeah. So it's it's cool because with islands, that isolation both makes your ecosystem fragile to 
introduced change, but mm-hmm. also protects you from the changes going on everywhere else. Yes. They're very interesting. It's, it's a balanced system. Islands are constantly that balance of anything you add or take away from an island will can throw everything out of whack within, you know, just a number of years, you know, within decades, yeah. island ecosystems can be completely turned over because of just a few introductions of new animals or animals taken away where, you know, that happened a lot when sailing was first new and people would come onto islands, hunt a single animal and leave. So they weren't really leaving anything behind, but they removed this one animal and then everything else had to readjust and collapse. Yeah. To fill it. It's real. The effects of islands are, are super famous. And actually, to bring the super dorky side into this, and mm-hmm. I'm surprised I didn't think to mention this earlier, <laughs> so the, the latest Pokemon games yes. take place on a chain of islands that are based on the Hawaiian islands. And it's cool because they introduced, you know, for fans of the series, mm-hmm. a bunch of the Pokemon that were introduced in this generation are Pokemon. There's a handful that are different on the different islands. Mm-hmm. And there are a handful that are said to have been introduced from other regions that have taken on a different appearance on the islands. And for players of the game, it's a cool collector. Th- oh, I, there's a new form of Meowth that I can yeah. only catch in these games. And this bird has four different forms, and I can mm-hmm. access the four different forms on the different islands. But that's based on this real-life phenomenon of organisms that end up on islands tend to change. They become different from their mainland relatives, and they can be different among the different islands. The the, the commentary in that game on island ecosystems was excellent. Yeah, they did a really good job. (laughs) It was really cool the way they handled it, how they did it with certain ones, and other things they commented on, the ones that were introduced by people, and it was... Uh, one of my friend's favorite examples of those was the um, Executor, yes. which is a direct comment on island palm trees, the actual palm trees, and then palm trees that humans have planted and replanted and selected are stouter and taller compared to each other. That's cool. I did not know that. It's a real, like, the if the executor, the reason he has a long neck is because that, that is a real thing that happens with palm trees in different environments. And that makes another thing make sense that I didn't realize. The Poke- Pokedex entry for executor in the game says that the island inhabitants claim that the tall, narrow version is what they're supposed to look like. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly. awesome! They did oh, really man. cool stuff with it. Yeah, and so that's yeah, it's it's a super famous thing. It's c- classically the uh, the the inspiration for Darwin to start mm-hmm. noticing aspects of speciation. It's made it into the video games. It's a really cool uh, iconic aspect of evolution. Yeah, it, it kind of just islands can just ramp up evolution in the fact that it it can happen quickly because it is a true immediate isolation. So. Yep. There's no, it's no like, we're mostly isolated, but every now and then a couple of us make it over and slow down the speciation. No, you are locked. So the speciation happens quickly. And because they're such, they can be such extreme environments, it can happen in vastly different ways. So there's fewer places you can look to see a better example of evolution in action than islands because of just how extreme they are to begin with. Yeah. They're, it's such a cool topic. Well, as with all of our topics, we could do several episodes on this. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure, uh, you know, there, there will always be someone listening who's like, you didn't even mention this thing. <laughs> it's because yeah. there's always a, a million of those things that we just don't, <laughs> can't get to because there's so much we could cover. Yeah. Uh, well, that that is about all I had to that's, say this this round. That's what I got. Cool. Hope cool. you all enjoyed learning about islands. We we had fun doing the research. Yeah. Behind this, because it was <laughs> there's some cool stuff out there. Yeah. Uh, as always, for the listeners, if you have questions, follow up questions. If there's a topic you want to hear about, let us know. If you're really interested in islands, we have an old colleague. Mm-hmm. who has a blog, and his blog, incidentally, by a sheer coincidence, this month is doing a series on, I think, the New Ze- the fauna of New Zealand. Mm-hmm. So he's looking specifically at different New Zealand 
life forms. So if you're really interested in it and you want an in-depth discussion, his blog is called Life in the Cenozoic Era. So check that out. I'm sure he'll have lots of cool technical information. And he does his his own paleo art yes, to does. go with the blog, which is, it's impressive. Yeah, he does a really good job. Well, I think that's about everything. All right. Next time, we'll talk about something else. Yeah. It's, it's always going to be cool. We, we pick nothing but good subjects. Nothing but good subjects. <laughs> or... If you suggest something, we'll talk about your cool subject. We'll we'll pick your good subject. Uh, <laughs> it's only the good ones. Though. Don't give us a bad suggestion. <laughs> uh, yeah, please do. If you have anything, questions or ideas, we'd love to hear them. Yep. Uh, and so yeah, thanks for listening, guys. Again, we'll see you in a couple weeks. One fortnight. Take care out there. See you later. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. For more from us, you can follow us on the Common Descent Podcast Twitter account, Facebook page, or on our WordPress blog, where we post additional cool stuff for each episode. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome. You can find this and other video game remix music at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope to see you next time. Thank you.